It is Sunday, a lazy Sunday, very lazy Sunday, but I'm not being lazy. First day, heading back to the studio, making music as much as I can. Feels good to be back in the harbor, back right in front of the studio. And today I'm actually planning on finishing an extra special song. Wow, that was so close. This very, very special song is called Lover Let Go. It is actually my upcoming single that I've been working on quite a while, like longer than expected. I rearranged the entire song, remixed it several times, multiple versions. I finally picked the one that I absolutely like. So the mixing, the music, everything is done. You heard the song in its state right now in the intro of this vlog. And now it's about time to master it. And before I show you how I master my track step by step, there are two general things you should know before we get to mastering. Number one, it's not the magical thing that will rescue your song at all. It's not. I always say it's like the frame to a picture, a painting in your home. The painting, the picture, it stays the same. The value of it, let's say you have the Mona Lisa in your home. The value is the same. The frame around it is just to be able to hang it there. Same for mastering. It's only there to make your song loud exactly to the point where it's supposed to be to release it commercially. It's like the last finish, the last packaging, but it doesn't fix a bad mix or a bad song at all. I'd even go so far that if you don't master a song and just make it a little bit loud, most people, most music listener couldn't tell the difference. The second, the second part, gear, all of that nice gear right here, it shouldn't restrict you from making a good music. It's not an excuse. You can't sit in your home studio with absolutely nothing and tell me you can't make great music because you don't have the funds or the equipment. Because I started with absolutely nothing. I started with not even having speakers, like these speakers right here, the Amazon 10 bucks speakers. That's the kind of speaker I started with pr music production. It is enough to start, it's enough to build up on. It's just all about your dedication, your skills and, and your experience over time. And then eventually you can start buying this kind of gear when you get to a point where you actually hear the difference and when you actually know how to use it and when to use it, because it looks nice, yes. I love it, I love the workflow, but I don't always use it. There are certain tasks that are just done better with plugins and certain tasks on the other hand, again, that are better with analog gear. And I just use what's best for the job. With those two misconceptions out of the way, let's get started. Let me actually show you how I master my track. Every single plugin, every single piece of analog gear that I put onto the chain and why. I think that's the most important to try and replicate this for your track because mastering always depends on the source material. I'm done. This took maybe like 45 minutes. It's one of my own songs. So most of the bigger concerns that I had with it, I already solved in mixing. And then on the chain itself, the track is running through bus 25, 26, which is the summing device. From the summing device, it is routed to the mastering compressor, mastering equalizer, mastering limiter, and then back into the computer. Let's start maybe with the very first thing I do that isn't the first thing in the chain. I always, always start with the limiter. It changes the sound the most. It is a wall where the entire song is pushed towards and it, it reduces everything that is sticking out of a song. So if you have a kick, for example, and it's like way, way, way too loud, it will be pushed and affected by the limiter the most, kick and bass usually. So that's what I do first, because the limiting is what makes it loud, but the limiting is also what destroys the song. And mastering is all about making it loud and ready for streaming, CD, whatever, without destroying it. And the limiter usually destroys and squeezes. So we destroy first, see how bad it is, 
pull back or try with other plugins to rescue it so that the destruction still kind of works and makes sense. So the limiter is on first. I got here the mastering limiter by Bathermaker. It also has a clipper built in. You can see right here, it's not doing a whole lot of limiting, just two dB of gain reduction. That's usually the kick that is driving it. And then I set it to 53% of clipping. So it does a tiny, tiny bit of clipping between half a dB to maybe one and a half dBs. You also have your color section, but I actually didn't use it on this song. Cause I already did a whole lot of saturating, clipping, distorting on the individual tracks, which I always prefer. So I don't need it on the master, but if I master someone else's track and they didn't do it, it's a good way to introduce that. So we got the limiter destroying, clipping, limiting, pushing against the song. And then it's about like, are we already at the right loudness? For that, I use Inside by Isotope. It just checks really quick. We got here now minus 5.9, minus 6, minus 5.5 um, loudness integrated in Luffs. That's totally fine. And to get there, I actually needed to like compress and glue the song. That's usually the next step. But in the chain, it comes before the limiting. The limiting is the last part before the mastering compressor. Here are the settings. Also just a tiny bit of gain reduction, one dB of gain reduction, um, attack 30 milliseconds, release 250. The mix is at 100% and the threshold anyways depends on, on your strength of the input signal. And then uh, a two one ratio. All of these settings highly depend on, on the song, the song's tempo, the feel of it. Is it electronic music? Is it classic music? Does it have a beat? Is it acoustic? Like, there are so many factors. But the one thing I always check is that the gain reduction is just like a hint, a tiny bit. If you do it too much, you destroy and change the sound of a song too much. Usually the more you, you compress, the less space and less kick. That could be something that you need because the person mixing and producing it had too much in it and it also glues everything together. But if I have to change the, the, the gain reduction to like 5 dB, like doing something extreme, I much rather call the person that wants me to master their song and tell them to fix it in the mix. Next up in the chain, the EQ. We have a low cut at 25 Hertz, cutting away the very low frequencies just for safety. At 80 Hertz, I had the feeling that kick and bass were a tiny bit like weak. So I increased it by 0.2 dB, very fine settings. I had the feeling that the entire mid and upper, upper range of the frequencies from 1,100, 1,200 Hertz up to 23,000 Hertz could like need a little boost. It's just something where I felt the song was lacking and it was sounding a little muffled and a little too bass heavy. So I, I, I changed that simply by just increasing. And it's again, it's like tiny stuff, like 0 0.9 to 1.8 dB. That's not a whole lot, but again, it opens up the track, makes it, it feels wider. It feels a little bigger and we still have enough punch in, in the bass and kick kind of part. And since this is a full vocal song, I think it needs to sound a little less bass heavy, a little more mid and top heavy for um, Spotify, radio, kind of that kind of direction. If this would be a strictly club track, I might have not boosted the mids and the, the top frequencies. Next up, it's then to the limiter, the settings that I already showed you. Sometimes I readjust to get around 2 dB of gain reduction. And then it's from the limiter again going back into the computer. Usually I used to use Isotope, just the maximizer, but I switched now to um, by newfangled audio, something called Elevate. It's a limiter clipper limiter EQ and transient emphasis. Very interesting. I'll tell you in a bit what it's about. Like that's what made me switch to it. You have like the limiter section. You um, just drive the song into again, 2.5 dB of, of like gain. It's reducing it by yeah, two to three dB. That's pushing it really hard. I wouldn't go further than this on this song. Never. Adaptive speed, so that it's, it's adapting. Uh, ceiling, of course, usually 0 dB or 0 point, minus 0 0.1. And it's just because this analog limiter can't 
really seal it off 100% that can't look ahead what is coming you need to do it in software and uh, everything else is turned off it has a clipper built in so if you if you're looking for something with a clipper that could replace this one right here um, that might be an option I'm very like I, I absolutely love it the transient emphasis for example if I turn it off entirely you can see up here that when whenever a part of the song is sticking out and the limiter is pushing it down so all of the waves like you see it's it's the limiter pressing against that's the gain reduction the transient emphasis kind of does the opposite you see it's it's picking some of these that are being pushed down and it's pushing them up again and this way you can you can trick it even more you can limit it a little more but still keep the transients and the sharpness and the poppiness of certain sounds and not make it pump that hard. Like usually when you limit a lot, it starts pumping. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't want that. I, I think like here in this one, 46% of that transient emphasis kind of counteracting what the limiter destroys works, at least for this song. I wouldn't do it on, on, on an acoustic song, but right here, I feel like that's something that helps the song to be louder, more precise, still keep the transients and just be able to compete with everyone else. Because mastering to a big extent is just trying to be the loudest, scream the hardest and get the most attention. That's unfortunately the way it is. Yes, Spotify is reducing everything to try and end the loudness war, but songs that aren't mastered properly or too quiet, still sound weird on Spotify. You, 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 you're you missing some stuff. And for electronic music, it's part of the sound aesthetic to make it really loud. That's pretty much it. That's my mastering chain. As of right now, it usually changes every couple of months. New plugin here, new routing there. Things that I figured out, it's always evolving. Trends are changing. Sometimes you need louder, sometimes more kick, more bass. It really, really depends. I hope this helped you, give you a little insight into what mastering actually is, how it works, how I do it. And the last thing you need to know about is what the sound, what, what does it sound like differently. So in the outro, I'll play you the first 10 seconds, the not mastered version, and then 10 seconds, the mastered version, so you can actually compare it. I can't play you more of the song because it isn't released yet and will be released on the 22nd. 20, yeah, 22nd of January. I'm really looking forward to it, to finally be able to share the entire song with you. If you're interested to get your songs mastered by me, if you're interested, as long as COVID is around and I can tour, I'll offer mastering, also mixing. If you're interested, the, the email is in the description. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow back again here in the studio. Uh, gear, tomorrow is a gear day. I got new gear, it's amazing, it's big. Looking forward to it. See you tomorrow, sign out.